Well, as always, thank you so much for joining us tonight at the Graves Lecture Series. It's always um, an honor for me to introduce our featured speakers, and it isn't any different tonight. Before I do introduce the speaker, though, I would ask you to please fill out the surveys that I gave all of you when you came in, when you signed in. It's just um, a tool for me to evaluate um, the effectiveness of the speaker and if you enjoy it, and uh, just to give me an idea of what you want. If you have any suggestions for the Graves Lecture Series, I'm open to that. So, anyway. As I said, our featured speaker is Dr. Kurt Kinbacher. He is an assistant professor in the history department at Chevron State College. Uh, Dr. Kinbacher received his PhD from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and he has also published extensively in several scholarly um, uh, art, uh, resources, scholarly magazines and books, and he's also hiked, biked, and fished across North America, where else, Japan, Europe. Yeah. So the title of his talk, as you can see, is Walking the Kamano Kodo, an Exercise in World History. So with that, I would ask you to please give Dr. Kurt Kimbach a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's really privileged for me to be at the Graves Lecture Series, so thanks for coming out today. Uh, Kumano's a river. Um, Kodo's a road. Kodo's any road, but Kumano is a sacred river, and it's been sacred oh, in the Japanese worldview probably for about a thousand years. People have made pilgrimage there, and the uh, road does not follow the river. It uh, follows its own twisted sort of path, but it goes to the river, so the road itself is sacred as well. And people go here, or have traditionally gone here, uh, for purification. And what drew me here was I've been teaching world history for quite some time and Japanese history for quite some time, and it's about worldview. Um, to think about the ancient world, uh, Japanese people in the 21st century think the way we do. I mean, in a way. They use the scientific method. Um, they're steeped in that sort of, uh, of enlightenment thinking but their deep past informs their present as well. So when you think about worldview, think about how ancients thought, uh, which isn't like us. Um, try to figure out um, kind of the world that they lived in. And the other thing, you don't have to go to Japan to do this, but I did, um, to see how deeply the past does inform the present, because these things are thousands of years old, and people are still taking care of them be wandering around these beautiful paths in the middle of rural Japan, and there'll be shrines that are thousands of years old with Hello Kitty bibs on them. Someone comes out and tends these things. So it's ancient, but it still matters. And this is the trailhead, um, which is, you know, there's a lot of good places to backpack right in our backyard, but you're not going to find a trailhead quite like this. And um, this is part of the original mile marker on this ancient walk. And uh, here is an OG. This is a shrine to um, something sacred. There's um, shrines all over the place. That's what makes this special. It's been put on the United uh, Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization's uh, World Heritage Site, which makes it great for tourists because now there's a uh, tourist industry that goes with this. Um, so although it's backpacking, and it is um, a good way to rip up your shoes. I mean, it, it is quite an adventure to walk it. Uh, but um, the sleeping's pretty easy because they have these beautiful little country inns in there, and you book them before you show up. And it's also Japan. You don't show up late, even when you're walking, and you always book your accommodations before you get there. Um, and this is kind of new to me, too, because I've been making adventures like this for quite a long time, and I was looking at my bookshelf at home today, and I have like a you know, big stack of journals in there of things I've done. And um, I bought one of these and started taking pictures and posting them on Facebook, and people didn't care what I was writing. They just said, more pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're a little grainy on, on this screen. Um, they look better on my small screen, but we'll just kind of go with it today. When, uh, when I've blown up, uh, up there, not, you'll see that I'm not a photographer. Um, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. A map of, of this. Uh, Osaka's up here. If you're familiar with Japan, Osaka is huge. It's one of the premier cities in Japan, one of the premier cities in the world. 
uh, it's not very far away, but once you get out of Osaka and into the countryside, it's like time begins to stand still a little bit. It gets slower and slower and slower and slower. I was up in Hokkaido, the northern island. I got on one of those trains that goes 200 miles an hour, and I got to Tokyo, and I got through the Tokyo train station somehow in eight minutes. I don't know how that happened. And I got to Osaka, and then I got on these little slow trains until I finally got off in the middle of the night and started walking around, and it was... Like I had stepped back. It was really cool. Um, now this is the sacred part of it, and people have been walking this for a thousand years. Um, this is now a railway and a highway. This is, I won't say it's untrammeled and unchanged, but if you're looking for what's left of the ancient road, it's in here. It's right in here, and there are three um, of the most sacred shrines in um, <coughs> Japan, um, these three. And on my walk, I visited two of them. And again, they're not places that you necessarily, well, people go there to be devout. They aren't like churches. They're not places of, they're not temples. If you're looking for that experience, um, Japan is, um, I think on the radio I called them polytheistic, but that's not right. It's polymorphic. They have great tolerance for multiple religions at the same time. And the religion that is, this is built on is a religion no longer practiced, but it kind of weave them all together. Um, it's called Shugendo. The um, modern Japanese government ended up outlawing it as being pre-modern. But uh, um, that's pretty much the lay of the land. Um, that's, oh, if you're looking for solitude, if you're looking for um, a mon monastic experience, these are monasteries. They're Buddhist monasteries. You can walk to them. You can probably take the bus to them as well. They'll take you in. Um, they have accommodation. You can uh, chant with them in the morning and uh, eat their pretty simple fare. I didn't uh, try it, but it is uh, certainly available if you're looking for something along those bents. There's a lot going on um, in this little World Heritage area. I'm really sorry about this. This was a bad picture even when I took it, but I took it um, at the uh, Trailhead Museum, which had a nice little tea shop <laughs> to go with it. But I just kind of give you some idea of the topography. It, Japan is extremely mountainous. We'll just get off of that, but you kind of see the lay of the land there. Um, from the ground's eye view, um, one scholar said Japan isn't mountainous. Japan is mountains. Uh, and uh, kind of, that's kind of the beauty, beauty of it is, is once you get out of the big city areas which are on the plains, you're in this, this densely populated world where um, people live in just these isolated villages still. Um, it's just has, there's something really quite magical about these mountains. Um, well, it's tr probably true for many mountains. And if you like to hike and if you've hiked a lot in the United States, it felt like the Appalachian Trail, the very southern section of it in July. So by the time you start moving around, even if you're walking at 6.30 in the morning, you're not going to be dry. And about 2 in the afternoon, there's going to be a thunderstorm. And after the thunderstorm, there's going to be these land crabs that go scurrying off and like 100 kinds of tree frogs of all sorts of different colors. So it really is a special place in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, kind of the lay of the land when you can... I actually see the, the surrounding countryside. It's also a really modern world, so the past informs uh, uh, the present, but um, another view of it from um, the transportation scheme. So I walk this thing because that's the kind of guy I am. A lot of people would, I'd see them every day. They'd have taken a bus from somewhere and um, been at the next shrine, and we'd um, have our rice and balls together, which is what they, you know, pack you at your accommodation. So... Um, there are other ways to do it. Um, you, don't you can experience it in a number of ways, and, and certainly many Japanese enjoy it. And again, it's a World Heritage Site, so they are catering to international tourism as well. Um, but uh, it seems like time stands still, but in reality it doesn't. <laughs> and there it is. Uh, if you have sprain your ankle, you can hobble a couple miles and get to the bus stop. Um, now, good luck reading the bus, but... Trains are in English. Trains are multilingual. Buses are not. Buses are not. Um, trains in Japan. This is actually the train out. I got there in the middle of the night. And I had been up in Hokkaido, which is the northern island. And that wasn't incorporated into Japan until the late 19th century. And the f first day I was in Hokkaido, you know, when you, you travel and you come from many different time zones, I was up 
before anyone else, and I was uh, wandering around. It looked, reminded me of a polder in the Netherlands. The streets were on grids. Um, all you had to do was turn left. You'd never get lost. You kind of feel familiar there. You know, it is certainly Japan, but it is modern Japan. When I got off the train in the middle of the night, there's no grid. Um, there's not very many lights either because energy is really expensive in Japan. So I, need, I pulled one of those maps like you get at the coffee shop you know, up on 2nd um, um, and Shadron. Um, still didn't make any sense. So I took out a compass and I was following these kind of alleyways and my hotel wasn't lit. But I finally got there. But it is like a different world. Um, this, this city has been here in some way, shape, or form for about 1,000 years. And sometimes you, when you look at what's laid out, it looks like it's that old. Hello. But it's a good place once that you wake up in the morning and you find out you're on a beach. Uh, <laughs> uh, sunny, beautiful, and uh, uh, tsunami warnings all not, no danger of tsunami, but the direction, should there be a tsunami of where you should go, are, are clearly posted. And this, this is a sacred spot um, here. This is one of the big jumping off points for the more arduous trek that lay ahead. Um, but it's not particularly a resort town. Not particularly. It's just a beautiful little fishing village, and it just happened to be you know, a nice day in July. Shinto Graveyard. It's been inhabited so long, and although for Japan, an 80,000-person uh, city is not particularly... Um, big. Um, I'm sure that there are multiple burials underneath each of those, and every morning and every evening there'd be the um, call to religious ceremony. And this is Shinto, so the, the native Japanese. Sometimes you see it listed as the native cult, but it is unique to Japan. It doesn't really exist anywhere outside of Japan. And again, the mountains in the background. Um, so emperors, um, retired emperors, nobles, they would have been staying in a similar accommodation, not quite as high before they began their journeys of purification. And it's about, it's practice. It's about practice. They kept score. And to do it, it was about a 30-day journey. You walked. Um, there were boats on the river uh, that were the mo some of the most sacred. And you were ranked according to the number of times you completed the journey, with 33 being the most pure. Um, and then, you know, I guess the, you also need time and money to make this happen. But uh, again, it's, it's, some, it's about repetition. And um, if, when, when I was walking this, I could see it. And I hike a lot, and people who hike, is, it, it is kind of idiosyncratic. Especially if it's in bear country, you'll see a big tree and go, whoa, that tree's 90 feet tall. And you'll say it real loud, or you'll smack your stick against something. But... Um, you can see that, you can just kind of feel that people had been practicing this ritualistic behavior for a long time. You know, it just kind of glowed with something. Uh, still in Ki uh, Tanabe there on the coast, and this is a samurai castle, uh, all this left of it. So the base is, you know, the, the cellar is still left and it's marked off as a, a, a landmark. The wooden structure is gone. But again, the ancient exists right on top of the modern. You know, people pass it every day like it was, you know, the courthouse or something. Take nothing of it, but um, certainly one of the you know, ancient places around. And then back to the route itself. So these are the three most sacred spots here. These are the three most sacred, but there's a lot going on here. Um, there are also a bunch of OG. Oh, look at these first. Uh, the Kamano Hongo Taisha, Taisha is not in its original location. The Kimono is a, is a sacred river. Um, this was right on an island in the middle of the river. In the 1880s, there was a massive flood that took portions of it away, and the, um, the locals um, took everything they could still find, pieced it back together up in the hills about a, a mile and a half away so there wouldn't be another flood. So it's not in its original location, but there's still a lot of activity here. There are priests and there are monks and there are just um, regular Japanese um, citizens here to perform some sort of devotional activity. Um, and again, um, I didn't ask. I probably wouldn't be sure. I didn't want to be involved in like disturbing their rituals, but there was a lot going on here. 
at the time I was there. Like in Japan, Japan's a very ancient place, and there's this notion in Japan that the world is, is not static. There are kami everywhere, there are spirits everywhere, and this <laughs> is an important temple to be sure, uh, the Nachi Taisha, but this is the important thing. Now, this has been sacred for longer. This is the, the, the highest waterfall, the tallest free-flowing waterfall in Japan. This is the spiritual feature. So all of this is in honor of something that exists in the natural world. Um, so a really a, a beautiful little corner of the world, but the world's alive, um, and there are these um, kami, these, these, these spirits that exist all over the place, and um, people still come um, to pay their respects. And they'll do it at certain times in the year, but um, here you come uh, whenever I guess you're available. If there are questions, you feel free to ask. I'm not. I have a question. Fire away. Uh, you, you looked at a number of sacred uh, locations, and they've been sacred for years, but did you explore how they became sacred? Um. The waterfall, yeah. I mean, how, how did somebody say, you know, now that's sacred? The waterfall probably was there first. Yeah, the waterfall was definitely there first. Um, well, that's a good question. That probably predates a lot of living memory, the natural features. Um, but, you know, Japan is a very seismic place. And, you know, in deep history, uh, it's painted as a trout. And every time the earth quakes, the trout's moving around a little bit. Okay. Um, so... Um, that's going to predate, I think, any of these religions, the notion that these are sacred places. That's my inclination. I mean, there are so many layers of sacredness. So in the Shinto religion, which um, doesn't have any texts, it doesn't have any um, founders, begins to evolve as a collection of the things that are sacred and unique to Japan. Um, and since there are no founders and no texts, uh, sometimes that's hard to get at. Um, when we get into the, um, the Buddhist traditions, since there are um, sutras, it's a little clearer. It's a little clearer. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see some of the oji that have stories, and those are those we can find out. Um, but you know, in the deep states, I think the most anciently sacred things are going to be the natural features. Does that answer your question? So, um, what kind of sacred meaning do they attach to the waterfall and some of these other things? What kind of sacred meaning do they attach? I mean, is it, is it represent... There, is, well, is it's this animism. Of nature, or it is. It's, it is the significance of nature, but it's the significance of this piece of nature, specifically. So this is more sacred than the rest of the nature that is around it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. There are sacred groves. There are um, sacred you know, rocks on the beach in some parts of Japan. Uh, and they are assigned this significance at some point in the distant past. So there's no linkage to con any concept of deities? Or um, there's a spirit to this, but there's no, it is not, it's this animistic world where there are many um, points of sacredness. Um, so in and of itself, it has this spiritual significance. It's not uh, really worshipped. It's certainly revered. Um, but you know, it, 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 there are other nations that practice, you know, other cultures that practice animism. Um, but it is specifically this that is sacred. So even when Japan was deforesting itself, and um, the other one of the other interesting stories is that in the 1600s they plant, replanted the forest, um, using Buddhist sutras as their guide you know, to why to be ecologically um, sound. These places wouldn't have been deforested because the spirits here were so strong they weren't disturbed. Does that make any sense? No, it's not. You know, Shinto is is unique. It is not. You know, there's an underlying sacredness to everything, but these certain places are special. It, it almost sounds like a worship of place, yeah. in a in a really interesting way. You know that I mean we talk about. Um, Eco criticism and you know um, ecology and literature and all and, and place and literature, but it seems it seems like place is almost worshipped in itself 
as opposed to an, for an activity that took place or something like that. I'm thinking about the Black Hills, you know, sort of. But, yeah, no, I think that'd be a know, fair comparison. Um, but, it, but it's because of those particular land formations that constitute the places of Japan, yeah. something like that, the yeah. Shinto. And they're all yeah. over. And I, you know, really, it's a collection of mm -hmm. these animistic things that make up one body of religion mm -hmm. that's uh, uni so unique to Japan it just doesn't live anywhere else. Um, so I think that that's probably a good of uh, explanation. I think reverence. You know, I know we use you know, like ancestor mm -hmm. worship mm -hmm. we use, mm -hmm. but they're not really worshiping their ancestors; they're revering their mm -hmm. ancestors. They do that too as well. You'll see the offerings to the people that have come before. You know, sake, water, cigarette, which apparently aren't bad in the other life. Um, uh, yeah. no, it, it, it is hard. This is not Western. This is so not Western. Um, that, you know, just to even be around it is cool, but to try to explain just how not Western it is um, it, it is difficult, um, which you know, makes it pretty unique. You probably didn't answer your question, did I, Bob? No, I think I, I think you did. Um, I guess another extension of that would be: um, is there are there any like healing powers attached to these these places? Is there any association? No, not with not with the natural places. No, they're not going there for curative. No, it's not like relics or anything. At least not in the Shinto. It doesn't appear. Now, there are the um, three really important shrines, and people are going to you know, take buses there. But there are 99 OG um, along the Route 2, and the route officially starts in Osaka in the ancient time, and the OG are still here, and this is our route, and these little OG are uh, lesser shrines. So they're important, but they're important to fewer people. Okay. And 99, the ancient world literalism is irrelevant. 90, there's not 99. Um, I'm not sure how many they are. It's, it's just a big number. So there's no literalism in the ancient world. But there's a lot of these OG that are scrambled in here. And some of them go back to Shug Shugendo. Some of them are Shinto. Some of them are Buddhist. Some of them are family altars. Um, some of them are in use and some of them are, are not. Um, but they're all along the route. And some of them are interpreted. Some of them are not. Uh, so again, it, it, there's like layers and layers of ancient spirituality on top of each other. It's, I think some practices are simply forgotten. Uh, the religion that this, this journey is founded on is syncretic. It uh, really mixes. Um, kami are the spirits that exist usually within a Japanese space, and that's what a Shinto practitioner would call it. Gongen are the same thing, but they're coming from a Buddhist tradition. There is this spiritual relevance to the place. They're almost always place-based. Uh, Shinto is the native, sometimes just referred to as the native Japanese cult. Um, it's been the state religion sometimes, uh, sometimes not. Uh, but it is distinct to Japan. These all fit into this religion. Buddhism exists within this as well. And uh, these are esoteric schools. So Shingon and Tendai are elite people that usually practice. The sutra they prefer is the Lotus Sutra. Um, there are good works. There's chanting uh, involved. There's study of the sutras. But really, this was a religion for initiates. And the people that originally practiced these pilgrimages, uh, well, they have time and money to do it. Eventually, commoners will take up the practice as well, but this tends to be an elite practice of purification. Um, yin and yang work their way in from the Korean and, uh, peninsula. It is the balance, balance between water and earth, balance between male and female. And Taoist elements, which to me are the hardest to explain. Um, again, Chinese, uh, the way. So, uh, really, it's a practice that combines many things. And you can do that in Japan, and people aren't uncomfortable with it. The reason that they became uncomfortable with Shugendo when Japan was modernizing itself is it looked um, antiquated and ancient. So the government outlawed it and uh, really did their best to stamp out practices, although clearly they didn't get it all stamped out. But for a while, you have all these things existing within one cosmos of sacredness, and you have these kami all over the place. 
One of the things I was doing when I was walking, as I often do, is I was reading a book about the lost wolves of Japan. I'll pass it around by uh, Brett Walker. He's, he's um, you know, for historians, when you meet a guy like Brett Walker, you say, hey, I read your work, which is about, you know, the best we can do <laughs> in, a, in a compliment. So he's really a significant historian, and he studies these, you know, canines within Japanese society, which in ancient times were great, because these, these are farming people, and th these foxes, the uh, kami behind this, you see these all over. They're enshrined. Sometimes they're just people's yards. Um, people are tending to them. They're wearing bibs. They're the, you know, essentially the god of the harvest. They're the protector of the harvest. They're going to eat the rodents that are going to prey on your harvest. Um, these are scattered all over uh, this route and um, it's existing within that Shinto world. So sometimes kami are place. Sometimes they are the protector of the harvest, if you will. And you'll see different things in the fox's mouth depending on who's representing it. But again, these are agrarian people. Uh, these are their helper friends in the ancient world. So are wolves, but that's going to change with modernity. There are no wolves in Japan. They killed them all. Are there still foxes? Yeah, there's still foxes. And you see, kind of see them out there. Um, again, um, well, wolves get the same rap that they get in, you know, Western literature after a while. As Japan way, works its way into the modern world, uh, wolves become suspect. And then wolves become um, targets for bounty. Um, this is down seaside, and, and this would have been um, um, Tokugawa era, so 1600s or so. You know, the Japanese uh, had horses there for battle. Not too much traction being done with horses. Um, these are for the elite soldiers. And again, they work their way into the religious structure. Again, these are elite people. Um, commoners would not have had horses. So you're going to see animals as well. I don't want to suggest this is a kami. The horse has some spirit, but that, the, the, it's not going to have that kind of reverence. Wolves. Uh, as far as I can tell, and I'm not a, Japanese don't always explain this um, particularly clearly to me either, but the, these, these paper lightning bolts are all over, and these are the protectors of the harvest. They are wolves. So um, later on, these, these become um, no longer popular shrines because they don't like wolves anymore. But this is the harbinger of rain. You know, so the notion that these are farming people and these, these religious practices are set up to assure good harvests and things. <laughs> Again, so you got, you know, 1100. You've got 1600. You've got, um, well, some things are more modern, but most things are pretty ancient. Most things exist in the ancient here, but they'll be right on top of each other. You know, uh, more foxes. The shrine houses something significant. It's under lock and key. There is explanations for some of them in English, but not all of them. So it is uh, housing something really quite significant. Maybe a relic. This one, I don't know. But again, you got uh, you know, rituals performed. This one, this would be the altar if you had an offering. This one's bare today, or the day I was there. So some of them are frequently visited, some not. Uh, Pardon me? Do people have the keys to the Somebody has the keys. Mm -hmm. Somebody has the keys. Yeah, um, and you don't see too many people out there, um, but you see evidence that they come and leave offerings. And again, now we're uh, getting uh, Jinja are, 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 are very similar. This is existing more in the Buddhist world. Again, um, housing something special. Not natural, probably man made. Now these guys, uh, Yamabushi, are going to be the journey leaders in the ancient times. And they are hired to help you purify yourself if you're elite. And uh, this became really amazingly popular journey in Japan when Shirakawa retired from the emperor, which was really a neat trick because emperor is really hard work. So he retired and he let his kids be emperor so he could like do this kind of stuff and um, make his estate bigger. Uh, but he hires this guy for purification. Uh, Yamabushi are just their title. 
and they are there to um, somehow lead them on their spiritual journey. So it's not just a hike. Some of the stuff you need to do on your spiritual journey, you could walk the whole 12-mile day um, partway on your knees and partway crawling on the ground. I mean, the whole notion is you are supposed to be doing something to purify yourself. And if you can do it 33 times, you've reached this special level of purification. Think about a Buddhist prayer flag or one of those prayer wheels in Tibet. You can magnify your, your purity by arduousness. I think that's when the Japanese government about 1870 stepped in. Said we can't be having that. The world won't think we're modern if we're crawling around on cut glass and stuff. But people did it a long time. Um, this isn't the place where you started in ancient times, but this is some of the. This is when you really know that you're in for some arduous crawling around. Um, you get off the plains and you start getting into the mountains. And there are some passes in there. They call them five sandal pass. They had rope sandal makers, which is what people wore during the day. To get over, you would go through five pairs of sandals. Um, so, uh, and again, they tried to, it is a road. They paved it at one point. Um, that, to me, made it worse. I think I'd rather walk in the mud, but uh, that's just me. So you start there. Uh, I wore um, shorts. Uh, pilgrims wore costumes like that. Uh, and again, this is a ritual practice, so the male and the female costume um, both, and there are certain uh, ritual tools that they would carry while they're doing their purification uh, businesses. And uh, these did have purpose. It's not like it's heavily mosquito infested, but these also serve as mosquito nets. Uh, if you will. There's not much standing water, though, because it's in the mountains. Everything's like bubbling around. So again, this would not really have been comfortable. I, I can guarantee you that. Even, uh, even in the winter, it's going to rain. It's going to rain every day, all year round. And then the purification process. And th uh, this one I didn't think very hard about when I started. Because this is right at the front. I mean, you walk three miles uphill, and then you run into this. And the story is, if you can squeeze through there, you're very pure, and you don't have to continue your journey. <laughs> and it was like, and I didn't, I didn't understand this at first. And the picture I should have taken, someone left a pair of red tennis shoes right there. <laughs> because um, this is kind of a whimsical place. And then I was thinking, well, you know, I'm pretty big. I'll never squeeze through there. And then they went around to the back. Um, it looks like that wall. There's no other side. Now, this is a metaphorical squeezing through. I don't know where the other side is, but if you can get there, you're so pure, you're not probably coming back in this world. Um, but, but these things, these, these kind of rituals are all over the place. Um, I walked on. I, I knew that I wasn't pure. Um, I wasn't sure that's why I was here. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I amazed. But I mean, this is... You know, metaphor, this is not literalism, this is ancient. I don't think anyone probably ever tries to squeeze their way in there, but I don't know. Maybe there is another side. So next time, I'll walk around. Um, and this is the modern world, so um, just like if you went to a national park and you had a park passport, you go, boom, boom, I was there. Um, I did it. Some people were on their little motorbikes, you know, just like racing from one to you know one to one, you know, get get them all in a day or something <laughs> like that. Most of them you can get to uh, uh, in not too great a distance from the road, um, but again, this is sort of an idiosyncratic um, behavior. So those are my stamps that I was there and saw the uh, specific OG and thought about my shoes that I didn't leave when I purified myself. Now, not all of them are particularly ancient. There are family and village shrines that get put up on the, the walk, and people from the various villages come and tend them. And uh, you can see this one is very well tended. The um, shrine is um, quite warm. Um, the plants are fresh cut. The, oh, on this day, I, probably was water, although I didn't take a sip to find out if it was anything that was more spirited. But there is the attention um, to this. But this is not ancient. This is modern people that are out, um, probably has to do with their family, you know, ancestor reverence, and uh, they will be uh, not marked on the map because 
some villager has just erected them in this very sacred place and they are tending to them on a regular basis. Um, not an OG, just somebody's daily re uh, ritualistic practice. Do they have to have a permit? Not to my, not to my knowledge, which, which, which doesn't seem very Japanese, but you know, on some things you need to um, permits and some things I think you just do. And I think it's understood that this is a special place and you can, and you can. Uh, it's not destructive, um, to be sure. Um, now, some of the OG are giant. Some of them are little tiny things, and uh, some of them are just all overgrown. So whatever reason that they were sacred to someone, um, they are not really being tended at the moment. Um, once in a while, I think um, someone from the parks comes by and cleans them out. I mean, this is a UNESCO site, so... They want people there. There are foresters that uh, make sure everything is clear. Um, there are probably are rangers, although I didn't see anyone but the foresters. Not in use, not, as far as I know, not in use. And then once in a while you'll run into one that is wearing you know, a fresh bib um, for some reason. So some are. I, I like this one quite a lot. This is, this is a Buddhist tradition, and it's a little bit later. It's probably um, Tokugawa era. It's probably in the late 1500s or early 1600s. And um, it's a bodhisattva who is an enlightened being in the Buddhist tradition that has um, not chosen to, in, in uh, Japanese Buddhism, you can reach enlightenment and then go on to paradise in some branches. Uh, he stayed. This guy stayed, and his business of bodhisattva-ing is these stones. Now, this, this pile gets bigger. People, when they walk by, pick up a stone, and they put it on the pile because this bodhisattva is leading the souls of unborn children across the ocean into the paradise world. Okay? So the act of putting the stone there is helping those babies who never had a chance. Um, so you'll see money on the uh, very top of some of these stones, but apparently this pile grows at a fairly regular rate. It's uh, um, um, you know, somewhere out to here. So again, very idiosyncratic behavior, but people know why this guy's there and they still come by and go, here you go, kid. Uh, sometimes it's the grove that's sacred. And sometimes the grove that was originally sacred is replaced by the grove that is presently there. But this is one of the OG that, you know, the, uh, that is essentially the grove. So these giant junipers, uh, some of them are 300 years old. And apparently at one time when this was really vibrant, and when the, the cherry trees were really special in here, you know, for their fruit, for the, for the pilgrims, but they um, also have a special place in the Japanese cosmology. So, you know, this is um, nature reverence, if you will, this particular OG. Um, really a beautiful one. Um, you know, after a long day walk, well, you've got to go up, but you can always leave your pack at the base. And once you get up there, well, this one's pretty active. This one's pretty active. Uh, there's more than water left there. There, in one of those, there was I, I didn't drink it, but there was alcohol, um, and um, people are tending to this on a very regular basis. So again, um, I think that's the grove, and I think that goes deep into the Kami tradition. That that's you know somehow the grove itself is sacred. Now, people have been doing this for a long time, and most of the ancient structures are gone, um, but the tea houses serve more than tea. Um, you can grab a bath. Uh, this is, would be your accommodation. You, um, apparently, there would be some of the times there would be little neighborhoods of these, and they would be farming soy, and they'd be farming rice so that they could feed the um, practitioners of these religions as they came through. So this tradition is really ancient, and it's estimated that this was first constructed in the 1300s. Now, obviously, the roof has changed, but apparently some of the original construction in here dates from the 1300s. So it's been there for quite a long time. Um, not in operation, but uh, certainly people have enough reverence for it to make sure that it's uh, not going to become completely dilapidated. Not in use, um, just sort of uh, a museum piece right now. But this tradition lives on. Um, 
<coughs> these guys. Um, not on the outside fantastic accommodation, but on the inside, I'm um, quite amazing. I mean, um, I figured I could sleep outside anywhere and <laughs> might as well go to Japan and sleep inside. This gentleman apparently was a big shot chef in Osaka, which is a huge foodie town, um, who disappeared up into the hills and three or four people a night stay with he and his wife and um, I didn't know it that I was lucky. I just booked an accommodation and people say, you got to stay there. How was the food? And it's like eight course dinners, six course breakfasts. <laughs> Um, um, some interesting conversations with, with her, um, although I don't speak Japanese very well and she didn't speak English very well, but really just lovely people. But again, this is a tourist trade and they, they know how to uh, make you want to come back. Again, so uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, life at the camp was difficult. Uh, <laughs> another tea house, um, retired folks who um, essentially keeping a bed and breakfast, if you will. Really kind people. Uh, they book with first preference to through hikers. You know, if you're going to make the walk, they would prefer you stay with them. Now, you can do this on the cheap. There are monasteries and um, other uh, group accommodations if you, if you want to do a bunk. Okay. Or you can stay with these folks and um, eat really, really, really well. Um, uh, a hundred bucks for um, lodging in three squares. So they send you away with a bento box, and um, you know, so you, you you won't you know, if you're trying to lose weight on your hike, you're not going to accomplish it. <laughs> You'll feel better, I guarantee it. But you know, they're going to take really good care of you. They know that you're out there um, walking pretty hard. So just lovely people. Um, she wouldn't pose next to me because my walking stick was taller than she was. But uh, uh, again, it's an uh, um, economy of scale. I hit my head frequently on their uh, door jams. But still, um, you know, life at camp was hard. Um, <laughs> and that is six, you know, just before six in the morning, so get your, your food in quick. You, know, you need to get walking before it's too hot. Uh, and you need to be at the next accommodation on time. Um, or else, A, they're going to worry and come out looking for you, but it is just culturally inappropriate to be late. It's culturally inappropriate to show up without a reservation, and you can book your reservations all over the place. The train station, um, if you have a, you know, a, one of these doohickeys. Book first, ask questions second. <laughs> So, you know, they fill you up, and that's just the beginning of it. It just keeps coming. The morning, kind of the, the average morning as the, 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 the really deep haze is lifting off there. Um, and then off you go. Um, How many miles did you go a day? Probably about 12. Probably about 12. And again, uh, um, people who backpack a lot, I'm getting older now, I, I can... Uh, um, not feel bad about only walking two or three, but uh, you know that's that's about what it was between places. Some days eight. Uh, I think really the big key is how much elevation you're going to gain here. So some days it was uh, um, you know since beautiful ridge walking, and some days you're going. Burr, 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 burr. And I you know destroyed a pair of uh, trail runners. It is uh, well, I'll show you some pictures of the trail. Um, Oh, um, again, in some ways, time does stand still. This is you know, traditionally irrigated rice. Uh, this is also organic. So this is, uh, this is for the tourist trade. I mean, they are getting you in there because this is healthful. It's beautiful. Uh, they're going to guarantee you organic food, and they're going to show you where they're growing it. Uh, but the irrigation system is very traditional. It's all working on gravity and... Uh, um, apparently it matters, and uh, I think the best compliment I got is some um, woman came back out from the kitchen and had been watching me eat, and um, she told me I ate well, which in, <laughs> which in Japan is, uh, and I don't think she meant that I was just packing it down, although I certainly was, um, but you know, as far as using your implements and um, eating your dishes in a reasonable order, um, so if, 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 you're, um, if you like to be a foodie, this is definitely just, this is worth your interest, no matter how you get there, because you, you can get there um, by um, taxi if you want to. Um, but uh, enjoy the food. 
Uh, Japan, um, this is 1970s road. Now, once in a while, you got off the trail, and the trail was the road. These roads are not in massive use anymore. But Japan is uh, developed really late. You know, we think of it as a giant industrial power, which it is, but that industrialization came at the expense of the rural areas. They didn't build these one-lane roads until the 1970s. Now they're antiquated, and it's just only the local villagers that drive on them, but you just see you know, how far they've come in a very short difference. Even since 1960, when they had income doubling programs, uh, you still see the hamlets. Uh, they're not inhabited anymore, but you can see uh, hamlets into the 1960s that could have existed you know, 300 years in the past, you know, essentially. So modernization in parts of Japan came pretty late. Um, today, the um, you know, rural side is as modern as anywhere, um, but it's only been really since the 1980s or so where they're you know, connected in every way, shape, and form. The dry side of uh, one of the mountain walks, and the, um, this is elite people walking, and there is curve labor that they had to command in the 11 and 1200s, and this is the road they built, and they are steps. Um, going down the dry side. Uh, I should say drier side. I mean, there's not really a dry side. You know, once in a while, if you, if you think about uh, mountain ranges, sometimes you get deciduous trees on the wet side in the United States and the, the uh, um, conifers on the dry side. Uh, here you get kind of the same kind of trees, but on the dry side you don't have as much moss. Um, looking at people's feet. Th these aren't for American feet. Uh, these beat me up. Um, I think they're for people with size sixes or something. Um, I, I, it, this made it challenging for me. This made it challenging for me, but it sure was pretty. That's the wet side. Uh, so again, this is coming out of a place that used to have a number of those tea houses, uh, a number of little villages for the pilgrims. Uh, but the road at one point would have been fairly even. Um, fairly even. Eventually, it's going to look like that in places. Um, and then you're getting close here to five sandal walking. <laughs> uh, and this isn't, you know, it gets to get a little bit more rugged than that. So you're going to get the full range of hiking experience if you go, you're going to get like kind of those beautiful, you know, um, single traces that all hikers dream of that just kind of follow the ridge and they go out at a grade that's almost unperceptible and it's just like you see the, you know, sky forever. You're going to get this, you're going to get everything in between. Question? Yeah, you showed pictures of the pilgrims wearing gaiters, and I'm just kind of wondering whether they chucked them, you know, on the trip or what, because I can't see wearing gaiters on the Oh, um, that's a really good question. I know they chucked their, their sandals. Yes, did they chuck away their gaiters and other regalia. My guess is they... What did they wear? Well, my guess is some of them had an entourage. <laughs> Because um, we're, we're talking about elite people. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out what kind of shoes. Joy and I were there as children. Dad was stationed there about 10 years after the war in 55, okay. from 55 to 57. So we were there when everybody was still wearing kimonos. You know, you didn't see modern clothes in the streets and stuff like that. And they all wore wooden, the wooden gaiters. So... Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't have walked no. here, but they would—they they would have been—they would have been a similar, um, I think, construction on your foot. But the soles would have been rope as well. Yeah, so there would have been like a little cottage industry of, of rope sandal makers uh, on the side. Okay. Yeah, so no, you wouldn't have been. I know you—you you, you would not have been wearing the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the wooden gaiters. The wooden but that's gators. what nope. she was wearing in that. Yeah, she was wearing. Outfit. She was wearing it in that outfit. But yeah. That's not what you would have. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you just wouldn't have been able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. um, no. So they wore rope sandals. Rope sandals. So it's the rope top and bottom. Top and mm -hmm. bottom. Just another beautiful day. Um, it rained a lot, but it was always a worthy effort. So um, it felt magical, um, which is, uh, you know, I get that feeling a lot when I travel um, in really beautiful places. but. There are so many people doing so much purification that it just kind of seemed to spill over into, you know, there's something, there's something really quite remarkable about here. It is, you, it is, an, it is uh, a, a, 
it's sort of this thing in the air that everyone that is on it, and they're, most of the people I talked to weren't from Japan, some, some through hikers from Japan, Canadians, French, uh, some Germans, pretty much having the same experience. And, and uh, not because they were particularly in touch with the spirituality of the place, um, they were students, just like I am, of the world, and they just kind of got the feeling that this is really a good place. Um, and I don't know if I returned any more enlightened than I left. Um, I think my, my knowledge of ancient Japan grew by leaps and bounds. Um, my ability to you know, do what I try to tell students is important to do when you're thinking deep in the past is to you know, look through a different lens because people aren't thinking the way you and I do. Now, they might inform us, but we don't inform them. And they can't read it backwards. Um, so, uh, of course, a, a Buddhist shrine on, uh, on to close it. Um, and I think with that, I will stop talking, and if you have any more questions, I will attempt to answer them. But um, it strikes me, a little bit I know about Japanese history, is, is that the social structure is highly stratified yes. um, and hierarchical, I think, to a large extent. And yet you have this, this religiosity that seems you know, quite spiritual. And you kept referring to it as this for the elite. So I'm wondering to how, how this particular type of religion or religions supported that type of social structure? Well, I think the social structure you supported that kind of religion. It's not that the... Or, yeah. yeah, I think it's the other way around. Um, and I think there's a, you know, just use the Buddhist faith as an example. The, the Shingon and Tendai schools tended to be for the elite initiative, initiates who had time to study, um, who had time to, who could read um, the sutras. But it's not that the common people didn't practice. They practiced... Uh, um, um, things that actually were a practice. They would um, chant, they would, um, do, um, Zen was popular among the, the, the commoners because it is the practice of uh, sometimes just sitting still and meditating. Uh, it doesn't take you know, deep reading to make it happen. So I think, that although the religion is shared, I mean, um, the masses are Shinto, or they are Buddhist, I think they are making different practices. So the people making the pilgrimages initially are elite. Now, apparently, it worked its way into other strata of society eventually as well. But again, you need money, and you need time. And during the growing season, that's, uh, a peasant farmer has none of those things. And I think that's the structure. And the other thing that uh, um, people point out about ancient Japan, um, the elite live a very sophisticated world in the world. You know, they write poetry, they dress in silk, they wear you know, the beautiful wood shoes, and some of them are um, beautiful. Um, but the masses, we don't think, did. And some scholars are now suggesting this is the frontier for you know they're eking their you know hacking into this massive forest so they can grow rice and soy to feed these people as they're coming by because that's how they're going to make their living. Um, and then they're heavily taxed. And if they can, they're going to have secret fields and live outside the government altogether, which was plausible in the 11 and 1200s. And so it, it is class stratified. Um, and although the religious traditions come from a shared base, the uh, religions of the elite are going to take a different form. They're also going to demonstrate your class. Yes, ma'am. How come the Buddhists in Japan look different from like the Buddhists in uh, Thailand? Because the ones in Thailand are really fat and they have giant ears. Yeah. The giant ears <laughs> apparently is a sign of wisdom. Yeah, you'll see. Um, the argument is that Buddha takes on whatever culture Buddha is depicted in. So in Japan, Buddha looks Japanese. In Thailand, he looks Thai. In India, he looks Indian. There are Hellenistic Buddhas in, uh, um, at least there were in what's now Afghanistan, um, from when Alexander's, the great people were still inhabiting. They look like they're, they're not look like they were in terms, they're wearing togas, and they look like people from Greece. So um, Buddha morphs. Uh, and I think that's why it's a uh, well, world religions leave their cultural hearth and they take on components that are important to the people there. So Buddha's going to look different in every country. He's going to look like you know, one of the locals, you know, if you will. 
eventually. And the fat and skinny is, uh, I think it depends on how you're envisioning Buddha. And sometimes Buddha is a mendicant, and sometimes he's a rotund, happy guy. And, and Buddha's not one person. Um, that, that's in, 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 in the Buddhism that's practiced in Japan, that's true. You know, the Mahayana branch of Buddhism, that there are multiple Buddhas. Some branches of Buddha, there is the Buddha, the first enlightened person. Um, but there is room for other enlightened beings in, most, in the Japanese world. Bodhisattvas just choose not to leave this earth. You know, they are enlightened, still around. Yeah, so there can be multiple enlightened in some schools of Buddhism. Like, um, they have, like, a good luck token that has a female Buddha on it. Really? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> can you bring that in sometime? I, I am. Where do you get it? Um, I went to a multicultural, like, in a, a national multicultural school in Minnesota. And, um, they were selling. Um, oh. They were selling these good luck tokens. I have not seen a, a female depicted Buddha. I, I would like to see it. Bring it by. Okinawa, Japan, is a lot like the mainland, except it's a lot more rural, and it's a lot hotter and stuff during the summertime when I was stationed there. Um, the people are. Tad bit shorter, a little stockier people, but um, the war did definitely play a part in the island. You can see it all over the place. The World War II was still yeah. on their minds. But there's a lot of similarities between the mainland and the you know. Hey, um, Kurt, another thing that, that strikes me as incongruous, I'm sure it's here because I'm looking at it from my my modern mind, right? But it is that militaristic tradition in Japan and this highly spiritualistic type of religion. I mean, I just, you know, how do those mesh? Um, or do they? Pretty gracefully. Um, you know, there is the, the discipline of being a warrior. And again, it's class. Warriors are a specific class of people. The peasants aren't warriors. And not until we get into the modern time. Um, and there are Buddhist monasteries that are martial. You know, they train in kendo and they are, if they need to fight, they fight. And, you know, depending on what's going on in Japan. So, um, you know, it's not that, uh, and again, um, people's practice of their religion and their uh, reality of their world, we all know vary. Because most world religions teach some notion of peace. Um, but no, it, uh, it seems to, um, um, Samurai warriors were devout often as well. Not always, sometimes they were debauched. I mean, usually we say Japan is a secular state, which um, I think partly we say that because, well, Shinto has been the state faith, but they're so tolerant of most faiths, um, usually. That's <laughs> not always true either, but um, they are, everywhere you go, you see spirituality. Uh, it might not color their politics, it might not co color their militaristic traditions, but it certainly influences their family lives. But I think there's so many different ways to practice religion, and rarely is there one and one and only way. Well, they don't have a monotheistic tradition, which tends no, to be they intolerant. Don't. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> you know, true. there's one way, there's one God, there's one whatever, but... How about the malevolent side of it? Because the horror movie, horror tradition, the malevolent spirit interest in Japan is pretty strong. Yeah, well, I've been kind of, um, I'm kind of, I don't want to say I'm Pollyann, but I get accused of being, being too optimistic sometimes when I do my history. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I don't, it's probably true. The kami aren't always nice. You know, the fox that takes care of the harvest is a pretty, you know, pet the fox. Um, but there are kami that are, uh, uh, like the kami of poverty um, is a, a thing, and it's not that you uh, want poverty, you want to find a way to um, satiate this kami so that you're not drawn into poverty. So there definitely are dark spiritual forces that exist deep in this space as well. Well, you know, I love yeah. horror movies, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, American horror movies are knockoffs of of Japanese sure. ones and 
the Japanese ones tend to be a lot darker. They do not have good endings. You know, the person doesn't escape the evil spirit in the end. The evil spirit always wins, you know, in, in the Japanese movies. At least the ones that I, I can think of, like The Ring and so forth, you know, they perpetuate each other. I mean, they, they perpetuate themselves. They go on to the next victim. You know, um, each victim becomes a kind of virus carrier, you know, to the next victim and so forth and that doesn't get resolved typically the way it does you know there's not somebody with a silver bullet or you know the stake um, and that's just a whole different that's true. take. That, that exists mm -hmm. right alongside um, maybe that's why you know this place seems so special because you know there's certainly people that die along their pilgrimage and um, with coins coming out of their mouth and then they put a little kami up to or a little oji up to commemorate them. It was part of their purification. Mm -hmm. um, there is that dark side. I, um, it, it's either not displayed or it's the kami that have <laughs> no longer been taken care of mm -hmm. you know, on, on this particular route or um, possibly because I am from so far outside I just didn't see it. May not be there. Yeah. You know, I, I don't yeah. know, and but it, it's um, just kind of interesting. Yeah. No, that no, no, I, no, I know that that, that is true. That it is not mm -hmm. all benevolent, Kami. Um, there are um, spiritual forces that you need to reckon with that are not pleasant, and that does exist from the same, you know, epic, you know, same era. Joy, what's the? Is it the shoujo G that has the saucer on its head? Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> yes. the, you, know, the, the, yeah, when, you know, when we were in school, we get these, the, the children's stories, you know, there, there's an evil spirit that comes out of the water, and it has a saucer on its head filled with water, and as long as the, the saucer is filled with water, it can survive out, out of the water, but it drags children into the water, and so children are taught that if they see the shojoji, to bow because the shoujo G is very polite and it'll bow back. And <laughs> <laughs> but still, yeah. you know, it's like a warning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost like grim fairy tale. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Well, Ed has asked if he could read us a poem before we break today, and I always enjoy um, Ed's poems. So if you would be kind enough, sir. I know that some of you wonder why, how I get here for a while. Two weeks ago, it was sort of a spontaneous thing when we were talking about poetry, and I recited that one about the, the cemetery. Uh, all of this poem, all of the program tonight remind me of Okinawa. I spent a year in Okinawa, but that was in peacetime, and these. Uh, the Shinto, is there a name for that? We call it the Shinto Crux. Oh, so it's not quite like, not like one of these, but something a little bit different shape? Or? There were those, those, those things are all broken out. Yeah. And on the bottom, or nearby, were usually the tombs. And the tombs is where the well, the, the dead were buried in those tombs. I think cremated. No, they weren't cremated. They were just put in there. Then they had ceremonies every so often to take the flesh off and stack the bones. And some of that I knew about and some I didn't. But when we went through that in wartime, I, I wasn't there when the fighting was going on, but some of those tombs and the crosses got pretty well shot up. And we saw skulls and bones and things. But completely a different world now. <laughs> uh, I had mentioned to him that I had some poems that I like to, I just like the poetry. It has nothing to do with the, tonight's program. That was, in fact, it's too good. A, this is like an anti climax. <laughs> but uh, as I say, I happen to have a poem with me. And this is my World War I. You know, you want to switch the light on? Please? 
version at the front. Now we're switching from the Far East to the World War I scene. And this is a little bit humorous and it's a little informative. And, and if any of you have been around the military, which I am full of, you know that when a general goes somewhere, he doesn't go by himself. He has an aide and he has a, someone to lead him and, and show him around and chauffeurs and all that. Pershing at the front. The general came in a new tin hat to the shell-torn front where the war was at. With a faithful aid at his good right hand, he made his way to no man's land. And though, and a tough sergeant there they found, and a captain too, to show them around. Threading the ditch, their heads bent low toward the lines of the watchful foe. They came through the muck and the powder stench till the sergeant whispered, Third line trench. And the captain whispered, Third line trench. And the aide repeated, third line trench. And Pershing answered, not in French, yes, I see, it's a third line trench. Again they marched with weary tread, following, the, following on, with the, on where the sergeant led, through the wet and muck as well, till they came to another parallel. They halted there in mud and drench, and the sergeant whispered, Second line trench. And the captain whispered, Second line trench. And the aide repeated, Second line trench. And Pershing nodded, Second line trench. Yet they went, yet on they went through the the mire-like pitch till they came to a fine and spacious ditch, well camouflaged from planes and, and uh, the zips, where soldiers stood on the firing steps and a major sat on a wooden bench. And the sergeant whispered, first line trench. And the captain whispered, first line trench. And Pershing whispered, yes, I see. How far off is the enemy? And the captain and the captain breathed in a softer key. Hey, how far off is the enemy? The silence lay in heaps and piles, and the sergeant whispered, just three miles. And the aide repeated, just three miles. Just three miles, the general roared. What the hell are we whispering for? <laughs> <laughs> and the faithful aide, the message bore, what the hell are we whispering for? And the captain said in a general roar, what the hell are we whispering for? Whispering for the echoes rolled, and the sergeant whispered, I have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ed, and thank you all for coming in, Kurt. It was fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you.